Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Um, it is a, a pleasure, a joy, and a, really an honor to be here with all of you today um, as we continue this very rich exploration of how our deep commitments to faith, to living, a sense of purpose and meaning to our religious traditions. Our commitments to those things support us in the work of, well, what do we call this? In the title of my book, of course, I use the phrase racial justice. And the book uh, actually is meant to be an invitation for all of us to reflect very deeply on what we're called to see more clearly at this time. So before I go any further, I want to really thank uh, my dear friend Owsley and the, the Brown family who are hosting me uh, during this weekend and the entire organization behind the Festival of Faiths, a tremendous offering, uh, a kind of a, a call to what's deepest within us and in this particular gathering with a focus on responding to the pain, the suffering, the grief, the longing, all of the different ways that our histories, our contemporary experiences around racism resonate through our lives and our communities. So we're called to respond to that from a place heartened and strengthened by our call to religious practice, to faith-based being in the world. So I'm here in the next few minutes just wanting to be a friend to you on that journey. Um, and I say it that way intentionally, in that um, while I am privileged to sit here, I could very easily exchange places with any one of you and know I'd be heartened by what you would share. What you are learning, what got you up early this morning to join in this reflection and to invite practicing together the sense of our ability to navigate these times from a place of our deepest commitments. So before we go any further, I'd just like to just share just a little bit more about who I am for those who might be meeting me for the first time, which is perhaps most of you. I am a child of the South, born in a town called Kinston, North Carolina. Any Kinstonians, any East Carolina, Carolina folks in the room? <laughs> this is a place along near the Noose River, and a place where my ancestors had lived for some generations. I was born in 1967, the last year of Martin Luther King's life on this planet, born in August, by April of 1968, as we all know. He 
who had stood for a clarifying call to cultivating our moral imaginations as we were asked to, to, to explore so poignantly last night. He had stood for that call. He had spoke to that call. And in the first year of my life on the planet, he was assassinated, killed, murdered. There's a deep teaching in that, that what we do, whew, as we turn toward these dynamics in our culture that we reference when we talk about racial justice, when we invite standing against racism, that this is, this is not for the faint of heart. This is a, whew, this is calling on us to continue to deepen to continue to sort of resource ourselves with courage and strength and love. Can I say that word again? With love for this work in this life, not easy. As a young girl, I saw my grandmother, Nanny Suggs, get up every day before dawn. And though she did not do glamorous work in the world, <laughs> she, uh, at that time, was cleaning the house of one family and probably named the outlaw family, a white family across town. She would get up every day, cross town to work in a way that uh, in, a, in a slave society would have been the same kind of work she would have done, to be clear about that. This was the late 1960s, early 1970s, and I would watch her get up before she would leave her room a light would come on from underneath her door. We children knew not to disturb her during that time. And she would be engaged in her own prayer, centering prayer. Uh, she followed the Christian faith and had, in fact, been called to the ministry. So for her, this was a deep discipline. It would involve review of scriptures perhaps a story that would guide her and inspire her, center her on her purpose, her worth, and her intention of shedding light in the world. Then she would come out of the room and get us up and feed us, prepare breakfast for us, and get me off to a babysitter or ultimately Head Start, because I happened to be the beneficiary of some Head Start programming early in the, you know, the 1970s. So I'm calling forth a grandmother that I recall, and through that, an invitation for all of us as we sit here to remember the lineages, remember the Teachers, remember the grandmothers, grandfathers, and on and on and on through our history, remember that as we sit here, we are not the first to struggle with injustice in our time. We are not the first to explore leaning deeply on religion to support us and faith to support us for confronting painful realities in the world. And we know something about how to do that. So pausing to invite a reflection to arise in you about your deepest aspirations and intentions for 
being here at this conference? What draws you here? In whose name you sit? The teachers and ancestors. Whose lives, whose experiences on this earth we may know much or little about, but we nevertheless may trust that in some sense our being here manifests a dream of what might be possible on some distant day. Your life, a manifestation of possibility. And we call forth as we sit here those ancestors, those dreams, those aspirations for healing, for depth. Call forth a name or two of a teacher. Call forth a name or two of a particular person or community whose experiences have taught you something about the value of turning toward rather than away from race and racism and its legacies in our lifetimes. So I just want to say how, again, um, important it is to me, it has been to me, to be joining with you all with this call to explore how we might practice together, live the principles, the values of our faith traditions. And I want to name that I recognize that we are coming together from a wide variety of traditions. I would say that as I sit here before you, I certainly <laughs> uh, feel the resonance and the kind of the rivers of many different traditions that flow through me. The Christian faith tradition of my grandmother, the first, the first sort of deep culture and acculturation, right, to religious practice was that African-American Southern prophetic call Love thy neighbor as thyself. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And remember that we are all, this is my grandmother Nan's teaching too, we're all one human family who've forgotten who we are. Remember. Along the way, I have been fortunate to encounter other traditions. My partner in life is an American who is a son of immigrants from the distant shores of India. And so at a pivotal point in my life, in my 20s, when we first got together, I was in a, at a period of crossroads, having graduated from law school and moved to California and just felt um, a little bit of the stress and strain of having worked really hard to make the most of the opportunities that had been presented to me. And I needed some extra support. I knew that I had been trained a thousand ways to use my mind, to study, to in some sense forget where I came from. But what I also was feeling was a sense of um, a bereftness, in a sense. Like something had been missing in the years of graduate school study and law school. I was trained as a military officer along the way. I had a lot of training. But what I had not been trained in 
was in some way of remembering where I came from and remembering the deep value of living with purpose and meaning and with respect for what we'll call the imminent, the spiritual, the energy of life, God, the trainings and educations that I had had up to then at wonderful places and universities, the University of Virginia, my home school, connects me with my friend Owsley, at that time had not really centered at all or up to that time had not centered at all on this inner aspect of what it means to be an educated human being. So finding myself in my 20s in San Francisco, having moved out there for a job, I was lonely and um, knew I needed something more than those three degrees and the commission from the military. I knew I needed something that my grandmother had discovered some way of grounding in a sense of purpose and meaning for the work, the one great work of making the most of life in this body in particular. Cisgender, female, petite, brown, signaling as I walk through any space in the United States, something about the black heritage and tradition and experience. So I knew I needed something and fortunately I found meditation through pulling a book off a shelf that my partner, whose heritage is in India as I've named, had on the shelf. It's called the Bhagavad Gita for daily living. And it was a translation of deep practices from the Hindu tradition that invited a centering on training the mind and spoke about being able to alleviate suffering through centering on ethics, purpose, values, and daily practices. And that experience of an introduction to meditation led me to find Buddhist teachers as well. And so as I sit with you today, I'm, and in respect for the call that was presented last night, that we raise up the faith that supports us, and that we stand and we share what keeps us strong with confidence. Here I sit. I'm speaking to you now as someone who has taken vows to live as best I might in a way that would, in a nutshell, I say do no harm, but of course we know we can't avoid doing harm. We can't avoid, in some sense, we might cause harm, but the intention is to help minimize suffering in the world, starting here, but not only for myself. The intention that I bring to every day in respect of the vows that I've taken is to love in a non-transactional, non-hallmarky kind of way, to have that fierce, compassionate love that motivated Martin Luther King and Gandhi before him and the long historical lineage of those who have confronted evil and injustice and suffered as a result. So I stand in that lineage as I, as I sit with you. And I invite us now to practice in a way that may be familiar to you or maybe not. But if you're willing to just pause with me I happen to have a bell. Um, my teachers often use a bell to support 
pausing and settling. And so I'll offer it here. And really, if you allow the sound of the bell, listening to the sound of the bell to support you in feeling this moment's invitation to fully arrive in your goodness, in your intentions, in your own traditions, in the wisdom that you already know and bring. May we pause together. May we mark this moment with intention together. So allowing the sound of the bell to support us, I'll lightly guide a meditation for centering on our intentions and opening the heart for the work ahead. So feeling the body in the chair, many of us here are seated in chairs, maybe standing. And if you're joining remotely or online, however you happen to be, whether lying down, whatever feels most supportive to you in this moment, the invitation is to allow kind of gently settling in, feeling the body in this moment, allowing the mind to rest, as we gently invite this moment of pausing bringing attention to points of contact between the body and the chair if we're seated. Otherwise, the points of contact between the body and the, the floor, just allowing our intention perhaps to notice the feet on the floor through our shoes, yes. The floor beneath us and beneath that this earth. As we do so, perhaps closing the eyes if you're comfortable doing so, and if not, maybe just resting the eyes. A uh, few feet ahead of you, lowering the gaze for a moment to allow this invitation to turn inward, feel the support. of the gentle way in which as you breathe in and breathe out, you manifest life itself. So inviting the mind to rest then on the sensations of breathing in and breathing out, really just very gently, allowing the gentle rising and falling, perhaps of the diaphragm if we're breathing deeply. Or we may notice a particular point around the nostrils where if we attune to it, we can feel the gentle flow of in-breath and out breath, subtle changing in temperature, the differential between the temperature of this body and the air around us, constantly interchanging in a way that reminds us if we're willing to see it, that we're always embedded 
in this mystery we call the earth. Sometimes they're given to think of as the environment out there. In fact, as we pause and allow ourselves to feel the support of the gentle in-breath, and out breath. We can be reminded each time of our embeddedness in this mystery that we call the planet Earth, this life. the gift of each moment, readily apparent when we think of the blessing of being able to breathe here now. The invitation that each breath presents for us to remember the preciousness of this life, that it is not in any way promised to us forever and that inherently, therefore, our lives matter. Breathing in and breathing out. And if you're willing, perhaps placing one hand over the belly button one hand over the heart, one over each, just if you're willing, inviting this touching into these very tender places that uh, each of us in our own way experience as this soft-bellied human body, the vulnerable heart. As we breathe in and out, inviting kindness and love right here, noticing any way in which it's been challenging for you this day so far. Each of us have arrived here from different places. And when I say here, I mean to this moment, wherever we happen to be. Breathing in and breathing out, we are here now. Ah, ha, ha. So perhaps if you're willing on the next out breath, allowing yourself to fall just a little bit more deeply into the sense that by virtue of your being alive, that life selected for you, you inherently belong here now. Bringing love and kindness to any ailment, difficulty you might be sensing in your own body at this moment. And noticing the quality of the heart in this moment. Inviting a sense of what is well and at ease within you. And perhaps you're feeling that in the warm heart center, it may be in some other part. As you breathe in and out, sense into the love and care that exists within you. And perhaps on the next in-breath, sensing into where you may feel the sense of your own loving energy. Breathing out, inviting the expansion of that throughout the whole body, maybe particularly in those places where we're feeling any discomfort, any pain, any emotional sadness or grief or anxiety. And calling forth the love that exists for you, perhaps remembering a place where you felt particularly safe, a person around whom you felt deeply loved, a teacher. In this moment of the meditation, inviting a kind of visualization of 
that place where you felt safe, that person with whom you felt safe. And breathing in just a little bit more of the energy of that love, that support, that nurture. Ah, and perhaps on the next out breath, releasing anything that's unnecessary, any holding that we don't need, letting go and feeling held by this love that exists in you, that you know by heart. Breathing in again, feeling the, as best you can, whatever is arising as you sense, the warmth, the love, the memory of being nurtured and breathing out, expanding the sense of that throughout the body, down to the toes, up through the legs, lower torso, upper torso, shoulders relaxing, releasing, up through the, the neck, the organs of communication, throat, mouth, face we're often holding more stress than we realize, allowing a softening, relaxing of the jaw, and softening of the eyes, up through the, uh, the prefrontal area of the brain where we're often thinking and processing and trying so hard, inviting appreciation for that part of us. But now inviting, shifting the attention up to the crown of the head. Ah, the back of the head. Imagine perhaps as you sit here, the sense of maybe a waterfall down the back of the head. Enlivening, remembering these parts of the body that are with us and that we often are not attending to or tuned to. So as we breathe in and out, allowing this gentle scan of the body to support us. Uh, gently attending, feeling the flow of energy down through the back, upper part of the back, upper torso, rear, lower torso, rear, legs, back of the knees, again to the feet. Feeling, feeling that sense of connection between the body and this earth. And resting in the love and kindness that we might bring to our own experience. And from this place of attuning to the love and kindness that we might bring, inviting more of that to support us. And as we breathe in, knowing that we have it within us to extend love and kindness to the person to our left, person to our right, in front of us, behind us, to the east, west, north, south, above, below. All around this energy of loving kindness, who emanating from the body in this moment, can we bring more intentionality to that? To being a source of love. To allowing that. to consciously flow through and out to everyone here within the sound of my voice and beyond to all the lives that our lives touch, the communities who inspire us and whose suffering we seek to alleviate. Those who are suffering the pains and wounds of racism in this time whether in this space or beyond.
So as we begin to draw this meditation to a close, I would like to share a poem which appears in the very front of the book that I wrote. It's called If the Path Could Speak, and I offer it as a support, an invitation. Beneath these words rests the awareness of generations and of generations and of generations that have come before. The awareness that each of us is a vital part of the earth that we call home is of the wind, the rain, the fire, and so inherently belongs. If the path could speak, it would say, we must assert that which already exists deep within us, namely, a sense of kinship with all those with all those with whom we share the earth. On repeat, in every language, unceasingly. We must assert that which already exists deep within us, namely a sense of kinship with all those with whom we share the earth. So if the eyes have been closed, the invitation would be to open them. Hello again. (laughs) Good morning again. (laughs) As we begin again, with each new moment an opportunity, each moment unrepeatable, an opportunity to, once again, center on our values, our commitments, to live with purpose and intention, to mind the gap that often appears between values, intentions, principles, beliefs, and actions. Y'all hear me? (laughs) I'm a sociologist beneath being a law professor. I studied sociology at the graduate school level And one of the things we learn there is that the world over, it's very, very common. We're in good company if we struggle between a gap, right, with a gap between intentions, values, high principles, high high sounding, high minded aspirations, and how we live in the world. (laughs) So minding that gap is where ethics, values, our faith may come in. So this has been an invitation for us to open the door to our own wisdom, your wisdom, for how we might deepen the work of racial justice in this time with the commitment to our inner practices. 
I sit, as I say, as a fellow traveler. And if you're willing to join with me tomorrow, we'll continue opening the door on this invitation to call forth the ancient wisdom of the Christian tradition, the Buddhist tradition, the tradition of Islam, Hindu, and any other indigenous or other traditions that might call forth the highest and best within you. So I thank you for the honor of your presence. I thank you for your practice. I thank you for answering the call, the bell, the inner bell that rang, that brought you here. And I offer my hand simply as a support, willing to place it in yours as we walk this path this journey to doing what we can in the moments that we have to help heal the wounds of racism, heal the separations of racism, and make real the promise and potential of living as if we knew in our bones, we knew in our actions that we are kin, are kin, one family. So thank you so very much for being here with me this morning. May you be well, may you be safe.